You are now listening to The Sound of Sanity, Beyond the Wardrobe Edition. This is a special series of episodes wherein Nathan and Ben journey through the enchanted world of children's Children's fantasy fantasy literature. literature. What will this journey bring? You'll have to come with us to find out. What will this journey bring? I'll tell you another seminal moment in podcasting with me, Nathan. And that's Ben right there. Hello, Ben. Hello, Nathan. You sound like that. I I do. I sound like this. And we are going to be talking about one of my favorite of the children's authors or fantasy authors that we've talked about in this little run of Beyond the Wardrobe episodes. One of the heroes of 20th century children's fantasy literature yes and truly so and truly so not maybe a household name the same way that like a i don't know a tolkien or a or even a rowling or yeah or certainly a rowling or a like a even maybe a kenneth graham i don't well probably more of a household name now than kenneth graham but hmm. i don't know i i don't have a good sense of it seems like Where in people know our people circles people know this person a decent amount you can talk to most kids Everyone has one reference point, which is a certain movie adaptation, which we were just complaining about on an aborted episode where your microphone wasn't working, that we we had a false start recording this episode. Mm -hmm. And in that false start, we covered several important things. We talked about the fact that Studio Ghibli has adapted three sort of classic works of children's literature and done a bad job each Mm. time. Yes. Did uh, Hedwig... (laughs) Edwig and the Angry Inch. What's, what's that thing called? Wig. Earwig and the Witch. And the Witch. And that just, I don't even have to watch it. It looks like garbage. It's CGI. It just looks bad. Everyone hated it. Everyone hated it, including the father of the man who made it, the man who made it being Goro Miyazaki and the father being Hayao Miyazaki. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of love lost between those two, unfortunately, oh, but this is not a Miyazaki episode. And then they did... Speaking of Miyazaki. Yes. <laughs> Uh, they did Howl's Moving Castle, uh, Hayao Miyazaki. Hayao did Howl's Moving Castle. And it's really a bad movie. As he often does, he just used the book as a springboard to do his own thing, which I wouldn't necessarily bother me that much if his own thing was good. But it wasn't in this case. It wasn't in this case. I mean, it's got some cool animation and some cool conceits, but it's just it's just not a good story. And his his kind of whole chip on his shoulder, understandable chip on his shoulder for a guy that grew up in the shadow of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But the chip on his shoulder that he has against war makes that into quite a preachy movie. And it's it mm-hmm. doesn't sort of have the same virtues in its preachiness as like a Princess Mononoke or some of the other ones that can be just as preachy, but mm-hmm. can also be, be good, be charming and good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Exciting. Good and storytelling. then the other adaptation is also by Goro, the son, which is Tales from Earthsea, which is an adaptation of... A Wizard of Earthsea. Ursula Le Guin's Wizard of Earthsea, a book that we thought about including in our list of children's, great children's literature. It, yeah, it, it maybe is, we should. I don't know. I, I would say it is a legitimately great book. She's not an author that I'm that keen to introduce people to because she got feministy and transgressive. She already was. Weird. That was just an innocent thing that she wrote. Yes. I mean, relatively speaking. Right. But she was already that. Yeah. She did Left Hand of Darkness about where you can race of people that can change their gender and stuff like that. I may be getting the details wrong on that, but no, that's she, right. she did transgressive stuff. And, a lot of gross stuff. And gross stuff in her personal life and like all kinds of things. Just not a great gal. So we left Wizard of Earthsea off the list, although I'd say in and of itself, it's a pretty great little yeah. eh, hero's journey. Yeah. Yes. Other mm-hmm. authors we have talked about are not maybe Paragons of Virtue, specifically Edith Nesbitt. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, Ursula K. Le Guin's corpus of work, her body of work is not one that you're just going to go like, get, give your kids a free pass. Go read all these, her books. No, right. you no could, probably you could, not. You could read not a a, most Nesbitt and it wouldn't matter that much over her right. personal life, but yep. not the same thing with Ursula K. Le Guin. Anyway, Goro Miyazaki made a, I understand, crummy adaptation. Or, it's, or medi- not it's not horrible. It's just mediocre. And I'm actually, I'm trying to remember how much it departed from the book. It captured the flavor of the book pretty well on some occasions but you know what the more i think about it the more i think yeah it departed quite a bit and maybe it's that it melded a bunch of different earthsea tales together i'm not that familiar with the earthsea world but anyway the movie is like fitfully good or entertaining it's just okay 
I will say, if you want to read Wizard of Earthsea, it's a good book. It's kind of a proto Harry Potter is how people might think of it today. Mm -hmm. It's not, it doesn't have the same sense of humor as Harry Potter. It's a more serious take on the same sort of thing and much more, uh, for lack of a better word, grounded. Mm, That's the word I would have used as well. Yeah, he has to learn some actual lessons as opposed to just being great at everything like our boy Harry. And he has to fight with his shadow self. And And the magic has much more to do with the magic of language in its way. The magic is much more of a sort of, oh, the magic itself feels, she makes the limits of the system felt as you're reading the book. In a way that's really interesting and fun to butt up against. In a way that the limits of Harry Potter magic systems are are not, for instance. Yes, I would agree with that. And it... On both counts, both the plus column for Earthsea and the minus column for Harry. It also, it's just rooted in the language and culture of actual medievalism. It's just mm-hmm. grounded in a more real sort of way without being super demonic or anything, as I recall. No, I think least. that's correct. Oh, no, it's an interesting book. I like it a lot. Um, I, now that we're talking about it, I'd like to go back and read it. Maybe, who knows, maybe we'll do a follow-up to the series someday. Yeah, I mean, I read it within the last couple of years, and I really enjoyed it. So, I mean, I Mm -hmm. read it at this age of stage of life, Mm -hmm. not a different stage of life, or maybe the stage of life right before this one. But so I can report from adulthood that it's a good book. In any case, that's not the book that we're talking about today. And we're not talking about Miyazaki, and we're not talking about crummy adaptations. We're talking about the woman, the womyth, the legend herself. Diana Wynne Jones, baby. And we're talking about a lesser known work of hers called Hexwood, Uh which is a really fun book that we'll get into. But first, we need to get into the life and times of Diana Wynne Jones. If you don't know, she wrote Howl's Moving Castle. That's the, if you're just like, huh, I'm totally lost in this podcast and I Uh don't know who that is or what you're talking about or why you're acting like everyone should know. She's the author of Howl's Moving Castle. That's, That's what she's kind of famous for. But also... A beloved fantasist and someone who influenced other people. Good mm-hmm. personal friend of Neil Gaiman, for example. Like, as a matter of fact, the book that we're reading, talking about today, was dedicated to him. Is that right? Dedicated to him. Apparently, he says um, that it was inspired by something he said to her about the interior size of British woods. Mm-hmm. So he was like, oh, I guess I inspired it. So she dedicated it to him. That's a very Neil Gaiman-esque sentence. And then he wrote a really silly poem to thank her, which I don't think I'll bother reading, but you can find it if you want. Yeah, there you go. You can. You, what you should bother reading, not you, but our listener, is the tribute that he wrote to her after her mm-hmm. death. He talks about the last time he saw her, mm-hmm. and it's it's quite good and quite moving and sad because she did not die a Christian. But we're, I'm getting ahead of Ben's self here, so let me just take us into... The context section here, where Ben will provide some much-needed context on D.W.J. Benjamin, what do you have to tell us about Diana Wynne Jones? All right. I can tell you that she was born in 1934. I can tell you that she died in 2011. I can tell you that she was born to that her parents were both teachers. They were in London when she was born, and she was the oldest of three sisters, which makes perfect sense if mm-hmm. you've read Howl's Moving Castle. It does. So she's a lot like the main character, Sophie, from what I've read about her. And even if you read Hexwood, the, books are, the book that we're reading today, talking about today, she's a lot like one of the main characters, Anne. So she has a line in Sisters and Siblings and... She likes the older sister female character. Yes, she, and she's good at the sort of slightly officious, but also loving, but also a little bit annoyed, but all, like mm-hmm. just the, the dynamic of sibling relationships she, she gets and she does a nice job on. She does, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's real good. She did not have a happy childhood much. I don't know. Have we talked about any authors who had a happy childhood? Maybe Edward Eager, who's the slightest, like the least of the authors we've talked yeah, about. Yeah, so if you're, if you're a bad author, then maybe you had a happy childhood. That's right. It's, it, it almost feels like that. I'm sure that's not true across the board. But Nesbitt had an unhappy childhood. Robert C. O'Brien, ah, his was okay. Kenneth Graham, not that happy. Yeah. Anyway. Having done the booketing now for many years, it is often true that people are driven to create art because, not because of, but related to their pain, their pain and their past demons. And yeah. that's okay. Yep, sure. So when she was five years old, World War II was announced. And so her family moved to Wales to live with her grandfather just for a little while. Her grandfather was a minister in some church or other, and she never became a Christian. Her her parents are clearly, from what I've read about them, they weren't Christians. But she wrote about not how his Christianity affected her, but how 
the cadences of Welsh, mm. stayed with her as an adult writer. Her grandfather was, I guess, eloquent and had a great voice, and she just could always hear him talking when she wrote. Uh, she didn't write in Welsh. So she moved, moved around for a while. Her family finally settled in Ex- Essex, but for a while she was in, oh, let's see. She was in, I'm not that familiar with the geography of England, the Lake District in England. Okay. So, and she had, she and her sisters, she had some run-ins with her fame, with famous children's authors as kids. If any of you dear listeners have read the Swallows and Amazons series by Arthur Ransom, I never had, I didn't grow up with it, not familiar with it, but it used to be a thing, more than it's a thing now. Nathan, have you read Swallows and Amazons? No, I'm like you, I'm vaguely familiar with it being a thing. Okay. Well, Arthur Ransom lived in the Lake District as well, and here's a little... Well, apparently, while the girls were there, one day he came into the house and he started angrily complaining to the parents that their girls were too loud. So that was one. They met Arthur Ransom that way. Mm-hmm. And then the other, another occasion, apparently, Diana and, no, not Diana herself, but a younger sister and a friend were swinging on Beatrix Potter's gate and she slapped Diana's sister's face. <laughs> so she was known as someone who was rich, famous, and hated children, apparently. I don't know how true that is. I know that this incident is true. That's it's recorded so as true. Especially knowing how many times in the Beatrix po- Potter world, little children type animals are caught on someone's property. Yes. And then yes. like given a whipping or something. Like it's, that. It's like, maybe she didn't hate children. Maybe she loved. I, I don't know anything <laughs> about Beatrix Potter. I'm just record. I'm just reporting. And part of it is I'm, I'm reporting. This is, there was an article in the guardian about this and the article in the guardian is like, this was a lady who hated children, but who was rich and famous because of them. That's a little quote from the guard. So, no, 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 that's true. I know no enough to know to she was she was weird. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Not a well-adjusted lady, I don't think. But no axe to grind. I'm uh, Beatrix Potter's work is charming. Mm-hmm. I, we've been reading it to our babies. I like it. It's lovely. So, anyhow, so uh, but her family life was not happy. This. There's an obit of Jones by a writer writing now named Catherine Rundell, I think you pronounce her name, I don't know, a fantasy writer. And I'll just read this quote because I think it gives you a pretty good picture. Jones was five years old and war broke out. Her mother, she wrote, told her that she was ugly, semi-delinquent, but bright. When she was eight, she knew abruptly what she was going to be. I sat up from reading in the middle of one afternoon and knew that I was going to be a writer one day. In calm certainty, I went and told my parents. You haven't got it in you, my mother said. My father bellowed with laughter. He had a patriarch's view of girls. They were not really meant to do anything. So that was the kind of loving... (laughs) It was not really a loving home. Diana was undeterred. She made up stories for her two younger sisters. Her younger sister, Isabel, would later become a literary critic, very well-regarded professor of literature. Her sister, Ursula, would later become an actress and a children's writer and a lesbian for a long time. Hmm. So I guess her sisters were undeterred as well. Did she become not a lesbian at a certain point? No, no. She was. She had a civil partnership in France and then in England with this one lady for a long time. There you go. So it's all very sad to read about. Anyway, it's no surprise that in her books, adults are never simply like, right? <laughs> there are good adult figures in her books like there are in this book we're reading. Right. They're not um, necessarily simply wrong. Oh, either, no, no, no. Is... It's not like that. I was going to say, because we're not going to be able to stop making some comparisons, stop ourselves at least from making some comparisons to Harry Potter. Right. Um, I'll talk more about that as I go. But I want to say the adults in Jones books are way, way better than yep. adults in the Harry Potter books. Like, no comparison. Rowling has a much more degraded moral sense about authority and stuff, which matches these decades she's been writing in, I suppose. But as Diana Jones once wrote to a scholar, quote, when I started writing, there was an absolute rule in children's books that good adults were not to be questioned or criticized. I was out to abolish that rule, unquote. Hmm. So you can see that, but it still doesn't feel cynical or even just sort of naive or dumb or whatever like Rowling's books can. So, okay. So she went to Oxford Starting in 1953, she would have been 19, if I can do math, which I can. And she went to lectures by Tolkien and Lewis. She was around when they were around. Nice. I found this little bit posted on the website Tolkien Gateway, and I thought it was really funny. So I want to read almost the entirety of this blurb. So from now on, I'm going to be quoting, and I'll let you know when I'm done. But 
Concerning the difference between Lewis and Tolkien, she has described the former as booming to crowded halls and Tolkien mumbling to me and three others. <laughs> Jones has remembered going to a course of lectures Tolkien gave on the subject of plots and stories, but that Tolkien was all but inaudible. She has also given a more full account of Tolkien's lectures, and here's an extended quote from Diana Wynne Jones. When I was a student, I imagine I caused Tolkien much grief by turning up to hear him lecture week after week while he was trying to wrap his series up after a fortnight and get on with The Lord of the Rings. You could do that in those days if you lacked an audience and still get paid. I sat there obdurately, despite all his mumbling and talking with his face pressed up to the blackboard, forcing him to go on expounding every week how you could start with a simple quest narrative and by gradually twitching elements as it went along, arrive at the complex and entirely different story of Chaucer's Partner's Tale, a story that still contains the excitement of the quest narrative that seeded it. What little I heard of all this was wholly fascinating, end quote. <laughs> and then continuing from this Tolkien Gateway piece, Tom Shippey has commented that Jones' 1983 article, The Shape of the Narrative in The Lord of the Rings, which he describes as analysis of that work as a series of movements, each with its own coda, says more about the narrative of The Lord of the Rings than I suspect Tolkien could. <laughs> all right. So that's all pretty fun stuff. Diana got married in 1956 to a guy named John Burroughs, who was an important literary scholar. He was a medieval literature scholar. His big thing was that stuff like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, Piers Plowman, whatever, should be read as literature, not just excavated for historical details or mined for linguistic details, stuff on the development of the English language, but enjoyed as stories with plots, meanings, morals, closely analyzed as literature, which all sort of, if maybe, dear listener, you've read Tolkien's essay on Beowulf, yeah. the Monster and the Critics, that should remind you of that. Yeah, sounds I'm, very I, Tol Tolkienian. Right. I'm going to guess there's some continuity there, but I think from what I read about John Burroughs' life, he was also dissatisfied, even with the emphasis that guys like Tolkien and Lewis gave medieval stuff as literature in their classes, which kind of surprises me, and I'd have to read more to really know what was going on. Well, well, one thing just impression. to throw out there about Tolkien that I happen to remember from doing episodes on Tolkien is that he is basically responsible for the repopularization re of the Beowulf yes. poem. Yeah, Tolkien that's was just right. like, hey, this is cool. We should read this. That's right. I mean, in his very stuffy British way, he right. didn't use those words, but – he mm -hmm. was. He did exactly what you're describing uh, her husband doing with right. Beowulf, which is why we have right. Beowulf as a sort of popular, you know, something that we think of along with the Iliad and the Odyssey. And, you know, it's like one of the great popular poems. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And so I, it's probably all, probably Tolkien added a lot of fuel to what that guy wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, Diana met John Burrow in 1953, instantly knew... <laughs> She was going to marry him. That's what she said. They ended up having three sons, I think a happy marriage, three sons and five grandchildren. Her, her son Colin is still, I think they're all still alive. I don't know much about them, except I know that Colin Burrow is a literary scholar as well. He's a professor. He specializes in Renaissance literature, and I think he's pretty well regarded from the little I know. So very literary family. And what can we say? She had a writing career. She wrote a few novels for adults. I've never read any of them. Hmm. Her first novel for kids was in 1973. She is someone who started writing for her sons, and her sons would be her first audience and her first critics. Right. But her first novel for kids was in 1973. It's called Wilkins Tooth. Or if you're in the U.S., which I guess we are, it's called Witch's Business. I've never read that. The earliest book of hers I've read is her 1975 book, Dog's Body, which I like a lot on the one hand. I mean, I loved as a boy. But it's also one of those books that as it goes on near the end, gets really pagan and really romantically pagan. Hmm. So I feel queasy about just recommending it, even though I've given it to a friend for their kids to read before I reread it as an adult and was like, oh, this is more dark romantically pagan than I remembered. I don't like that part of it. So I, anyway, Diane Wynne Jones is pagan. Mm -hmm. She's very pagan. But I don't find all of her books problematic that way. Right. So, but be a little, little careful with her. She wrote more than 40 books for kids by the time she was done. It's a lot. Just to go back to Harry Potter for a second. Man, once you read her Crestomancy series, which is seven novels and some short stories, you realize how much of a debt Harry Potter owes to those books, hmm. which is about kids learning magic at an enchanted castle school sort of place where this nine-lived enchanter 
plays his cards close to the vest as he does his best to deal with dangerously powerful children and the schemes of bad wizards. Right. Seriously, that's what the Crestomancy series is about. The first one is called Charmed Life. I love it. I was like, wow, Harry Potter stole a lot from this book. It, they're different from Harry Potter, and then you're not following the same set of characters from book to book. It's like different episodes in the same world. There are some overlapping characters, especially Crestomancy himself. Diana Wynne Jones was interviewed by the newspaper, The Guardian, in 2003, and she said, I think that Rowling read my books as a young person and remembered lots of stuff. There are so many striking similarities. Okay, as The Guardian notes, that is a pretty generous thing to say. Right. If you read these books, you'll be like, what? So it, it, it is a silver lining, though, that she was able to ride the Harry Potter wave to bestseller status and financial not that she was making no money off her books, but she made a bunch of money. So because in 1999, which is two years after the first Harry Potter novel came out, HarperCollins started publishing her books again to capitalize on children's fantasy and her cult following, which she'd always had. And she always had critical success, too. That's important to say. People were like, oh, you're a good writer. It, this made her popular. She right. started selling things like Howl's Moving Castle. It helped that Miyazaki made his crummy version of it which is just a little bit a couple years out 2004 i think is that right that sounds right i don't remember but that helped too because that okay and that helped propel howl's moving castle further and howl's moving castle won the phoenix award which is this cool award that looks for under the radar books from 20 years ago right that are awesome (laughs) so so it awards yeah it gives an award to 20 year old books Uh, i think that's really fun so it won that and so she her star kind of rose and i'm glad but she exerted a lot of influence on other writers. We talked about Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman also, he writes a lot of gross pagan things, and I don't recommend him really. But he is very smart and perceptive, interesting guy, interesting writer, interesting critic. And he says she was quite simply the best writer for children of her generation, unquote. He has a lot to say about her. Mm-hmm. and just has a super high opinion of her. He's kind of, Gaiman is kind of a fun hyperbolist. He Mm -hmm. likes to say hyperbolic things about people in their books. And he said that Diana Wynne-Jones was like the smartest, funniest, best person he ever knew, things like that. You can read read his take on her, and it is really sweet. Here's a quote. Here's a quote from him that's not really about her. It's about her plots and things, which as we'll note when we talk about this book, boy, does she like complicated Mm -hmm. plots. And man, is it fun. It was fun as a kid. I guess I'll talk about that when we get to baggage. And it's, really, it's still really fun as an adult. But here's what he said. This is out of context. Quote, years later when I met Diana, I talked to her, I remember, about her final chapters. Because I said, I had never hit a final chapter of yours that I have not had to then start thumbing back through the book and figuring out the clues and putting it all into order. And she said, that's because you read like an adult, Neil. You don't read like a child any longer. I said, what's the difference? She said, children read every word and take everything in, adults assign importance to some sentences or things, and they will dismiss things, and they don't carry it forward, unquote. <laughs> Interesting. It's pretty cool. So, and then Neil Gaiman goes on to talk about how when he would read her books out loud to his kids, he would see that she was right. He'd be like, oh, as I'm reading this out loud to you, suddenly that little detail does seem important, and I do remember it. Right. It's obvious my kids are tracking that, but I did dismiss it, just reading it myself. That's pretty fun. The only other thing I'll say, so her son, I was reading this, I think it was a transcript of a long interview between several people like Neil Gaiman and this other fantasy author and a son and a grandson. It was a, it was a pretty fun interview. We'll link it in the show notes. And, but her son, Colin Burrow, the literary scholar, literary critic of the Renaissance, he was saying that you notice a lot of sort of villainous mother witch characters. Hmm. That's just her relationship with her mom. Coming out. And also, you notice all of these glamorous masculine characters, which yeah. are a sort of antidote or shield. Uh, very, it's very interesting because you've got Howl, yeah. who's this silly, vain wizard who actually, well, he's kind of like our guy Mordion in Hexwood. Mm-hmm. Mordion? Mordion? I don't know how you pronounce his name. Or Crestomancy mm-hmm. in the Crestomancy series. series. These guys are all, they're all dressy. In, in some way, they may be vain, or they're at least odd, but they're actually also, they're all very safe guys who actually care. <laughs> they're responsible. Mm-hmm. They may appear to be childish sometimes, 
they may be annoying sometimes, but they're actually solid father figures or mm. protectors. And they're just good guys. So that's another throwback in these books. Unlike the Harry Potter series, and I just want to keep comparing them because I think it's instructive. Yeah, I think so too. Is you get Harry Potter, you have some good adults. You even have some very good adults. But by and large, the adults, if they aren't simply irresponsible, they're at least not able to take care of you. Mm -hmm. And they prove that again and again. And in Jones's books, that's just not true. It's just not true. Crestomancy is a guy, an older guy, like a dad, Mm -hmm. husband, who does take care of people. And he'll come in, and he's sort of a frumpy guy with a short temper and just quirky, weird. But he'll cu- but he will protect you. Mordion in this book, actually, he will be the hero. Yeah, right. he he is going to protect the girl. And then Hal, yeah, actually Hal, for all his vanity and silliness, is going to protect the girl, save the day. Mm-hmm. And that's just fun. It's a throwback. And so I don't think, despite Jones's idiosyncrasies and paganism, she's not. What you call, she's some kind of feminist, but she's not like even a rowling type of feminist. Mm-hmm. She's actually much more conservative and traditional in her broken and reactive way. And it's sweet. It's sweet. That's another thing that's striking if you read, if you do read Charmed Life or the Crestomancy stuff, you put it up against Harry Potter. You're mm-hmm. like, these adults are not the same thing. Right. There are plenty of adults that just stink, but there's also adults who are really cool. And the reason they don't tell you things is because you're a brat. Mm-hmm. And they don't have to tell you those things. And they know what they're doing better than you. Now, and this is such a different flavor than Harry Potter. Where Harry and his three friends, or his two friends, are always right about everything. They're and any adult right. who opposes them is an idiot or outright malevolent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when they and when adults give their justification, actually, adults don't even have a justification for not telling them stuff a lot of the time. It's just they're not thinking of it or they don't. The adults are immature enough to not be thinking of training Harry and his friends or... They have some ridiculous justification like Dumbledore. Yeah, Dumbledore always, like, she. it feels like she wrote the plot first and then <sighs> tried to make the character yeah, beats yeah, work. Yeah. And, and Diana Wynne-Jones does not, I, I won't say never, mm-hmm. but Diana Wynne-Jones, as a rule, she does not make that kind of mistake. She treats adults with respect, too. Right. Uh, and she just respects children and adults both more. And she's just not afraid to write bratty children, who you still somehow like, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I like her bratty kids. But she's also like, yeah, they're brats. <laughs> they're not maybe irredeemable brats, but of course, if you were an adult, you would be annoyed and you would treat them this way. Don't be silly. These are just dumb kids. Right. Well, this is the sense in which she's a good humorist, so it almost often feels like every character is their own kind of brat. <laughs> that's you know, right. You know, just, uh, and almost, that's really fun. And that's fun, but not in a way that takes away from any of what you just said in terms of there actually being characters that you can trust, that you can respect, that have yeah. real power and real authority. But it's like everybody's just a little bit goofy it's like you're you're living in a world where uh, I, I, in my head i keep comparing it to the coen brothers it's not like the coen brothers because they're just cynical and mean and they hate mm-hmm. everyone it's not that but it is similar in that if you watch oh brother where art thou it's like everybody in this character in this movie is just 10 <laughs> percent. all heroes all villains <laughs> <Right>. everyone <laughs> we're all just a little bit dumb you can we, laugh at everyone right we're laughing at everybody and, and she she does have that in a very benevolent kind of a way and then it is the difference between it's like Howl's Moving Castle, Sophie's a brat. Harry Potter, Harry's a brat. J.K. Rowling doesn't know it, and Diana Wynne-Jones does, and that Mm. really makes all the difference. Like, in Diana Wynne-Jones, the universe is constantly conspiring to either punish someone or or lightly discipline someone or overlook someone being a brat, all of which are legitimate options. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Harry Potter, Harry's a brat for large chunks of those books and we're just supposed to think that's what it means to be an adolescent or that's what it is to be a misunderstood a, hero a misunderstood hero and it's just so tiresome <laughs> and i don't even say that as a grumpy adult i say that as like when i read it as how well, i guess i was always a little bit old for harry potter we were harry potter kind of came right a little bit after us in terms of our personal chronologies mm-hmm. but it's just i didn't like identifying with that kid i wouldn't want to be hang out with them and you don't feel that way about Diana Wynne Jones' universe or her characters. No. In fact, one weird thing about her characters is they all have this flavor of this is just some ordinary person. Mm-hmm. However powerful they may be or evil, they're also just kind of an ordinary person. And she always manages that. It's a very interesting quality to me. It's a wonderful quality. It's what makes the book Howl's Moving Castle so much better than the movie. 
Mm-hmm. You really love Hal and Sophie and you really understand them and you laugh at them, but you also laugh with them and they mm-hmm. also sort of learn to laugh at themselves. And it's just, it's very charming. The other thing I keep comparing it to in my mind, which is, this is maybe overpraising Diana Wynne Jones to compare her to the greatest female writer of all time, but there's something a little bit Jane Austen-y about it in that Jane Austen is able to create these characters that are just funny you know, that we laugh at even the heroes of her novels, even an Elizabeth or a Darcy, mm-hmm. but we also can admire their good qualities. It's just like she's got a wry enough approach to life that you can kind of enjoy what's foolish about her characters without being overwhelmed or without being asked to call what's good, what's evil good or what's good evil. Yeah, that's um, right. So she's great. And I think it is absolutely instructive and worth comparing her to Harry Potter because she consistently... You, you, we could maybe come up with some things that Harry Potter does better than her. I, I have no idea what, but maybe we could. But I, I, I here, I'll, I'll say what I think Harry Potter does do better. Um, and this is something. Well, I'll just say it first. Uh, Harry Potter creates a cool world that you get to live in for seven books. Right. Diana Wynne Jones, even though her Christomancy series actually is seven books, it is not. It's more like all these different worlds right. that fit into this you know, all these different microcosms. Diana Wynne Jones just wasn't ever trying to do the same thing Harry Potter did. And so when when you read Harry Potter, you're like, man, I just like this world. I like the flavor of things. Diana Wynne Jones won't give you that in the same way. It's just not a thing that she does. Right. You get to live in a world for a much shorter amount of time, and she doesn't do the same kinds of detailing that Rowling does. Mm -hmm. Her details are much more kind of on the level of character in the way that we're talking about, like where characters become aware of themselves and their own faults and other people and their faults and their virtues and kind of are constantly re-examining what's going on in the light of who they are and who other people are. And that's just a very different quality than Harry Potter. It's just a different thing. Right. Yeah, Um, exactly. I mean, we've talked about this sort of thing before. One thing that actually works very well about Harry Potter is how boring ultimately Harry is and how boring some of his friends are actually because they are just Harry's an every man and some of his friends are every men or Mm -hmm. every woman. And so it's more of a experience for the reader of just entering into the world and kind of walking around and imagining what it would be like to play Quidditch and all that sort of Mm -hmm. stuff. Whereas somebody like Diana Wynne Jones is going to be much more specific in her comedy and her character and in her, but also a little bit more twee and removed in terms of actually giving you a sandbox to play in which isn't a bad thing it's just like you said it's, she's just doing something else thing. yeah 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 yep well ben perhaps i will answer first what baggage i brought to this book not a whole lot uh, diana Wynne jones was introduced to me by my good friend benjamin solzer i saw the house movie castle movie when it came out in we've established 2004 didn't think much mm-hmm. of it liked a couple ideas in it, all of which it turns out belong to Diana Wynne Jones. Ideas mm-hmm. like Calcifer, played by the great Billy Crystal <laughs> in that film, <laughs> in, the, in the English dub. Da, da, so. da. But I did not read these books until later in life, specifically Howl's Moving Castle was a, a recommendation by Mr. Solzer. I've not read a lot of her. I would love to have more time and space to read more of her because I really like her and think she's great. And that is my baggage with Jan- Diana Wynne Jones. What is yours? Man, I found her early on. Maybe Howl's Moving Castle was the first book. In fact, I'm pretty sure I have a big memory of finding her books in my elementary school library. And I think Howl's Moving Castle was there. I think I read that. And then I read the sequel, the first sequel, which is a castle in the sky or castle in the air. (laughs) I always get confused. It's one of those two. Castle in the air. Okay. Castle in the sky is... Miyazaki. Miyazaki, And totally unrelated Miyazaki movie in this case. Yes. Okay. So... And then I found other stuff at the library. I just, I started checking out pretty much everything that they had. Right. I read through a lot of her books. She's definitely darker. She can get dark. She can, she can get pretty dark in terms of the violence and the themes. Not that she's going to be gory with you, really, or not much anything like that. But just the sense of the world is a dark place. Evil things happen, and really weird things happen, and there's weird darkness out there, and sometimes stories end very sadly. Right. I remember she ended this book. I'm not going to say what book. I don't want to give any spoilers, actually, but I just remember one book that I read. It was like, oh, that ending made me really sad, and she left me there. 
props to you if you're a kid's author and you can pull that off and still make me want to read your stuff. Right. Most of her books have endings on the happy or happier side, like Hexwood. And a lot of her stuff is more comic in nature. She always has an element of comedy and irony, always. But some of her stuff is just funnier. Right. Howl's Moving Castle is at least half comedy. Right. It's great. And so are the sequels. And then the Crestomancy series is probably about half comedy. It's really, it's funny. And, and other books are too. So I read a bunch of her books. I was quite taken with her. I like the texture of her worlds. I like the sense that she was always, I'm no, I, I was never interested in mystery novels, but hers are, she constructs plots like they're mysteries. Mm-hmm. She leaves all these clues out on the table and you don't even realize they're, they, that they were clues until you get to the end of the book and you're like, wait a minute, wait, what just happened? How was this set up? How did I miss, wait, what? And you're just, it's hard, even as an adult. Like, as a kid, I was like that. I guess I wasn't really the kid she describes who you know, reads every word and takes everything in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was just more ADD about it. But it, it has that quality. Hexwood is probably one of the more demanding books in some respects yeah. by her. It's pretty demanding. And as a kid, I remember you get lost. It's like a maze you get lost in. But it's, I loved being lost in a maze. I loved it when an author would do that for me. Um, because she just, as I, we've said multiple times, I think, on this podcast, she does not condescend to children. She's like, I respect your ability to read this book and try and keep up. Mm. And you're like, whoa, okay. And uh, Hexwood has that flavor. Some other books have that flavor. I loved that. So I was a big fan of her from elementary school age on, probably third, fourth grade. I don't really know. I read a lot of stuff, not everything, but I read a lot of stuff and reread some things like Hexwood, Dog's Body. There's probably a couple of others, Tale of Time City, some that I would just read and reread. So that's my baggage. Cool. Well, let's... All right, let's talk about what we... Thought about this book. I will go first because hey. I think, listener, you can already tell that Ben grew up with this book and loved this book, whereas this was my first time. So yeah. even though I'm the host and it's weird for me to make myself go first, it feels like in the dramatic sense of what makes sense for the podcast. I like it. I should ask myself, Nathan, what did you think about this book? The answer is I really liked it. It might be my favorite. Well, that's hard to say. Was it my favorite thing that we have read for this Bond the Wardrobe thing? Hmm. That's really hard because it's hard to compare it with yeah all the other stuff. Yeah, pretty but different. It was a lot of fun. I love Diana Wynn Jones. I love her sense of humor. The world building was awfully fun. I don't know uh, what did it remind me of. It reminded me of I can't name a specific thing, but just it reminded me of the joy of reading sci-fi before I was familiar with all the tropes. Yeah, I guess right. You know, even just re- reading something like Wrinkle in Time, which I don't think is a great book, but reading it for the first time when I was a kid and being like, there's a giant brain in a city, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Or reading, oh, I don't know, reading Dracula for the first time and being like, oh, it's Lucy's become a vampire. You know, there's certain things that are total tropes, but mm-hmm. they're and and they're really fun when you discover them for the first time. And then, yeah. and then you read them in a bunch of other stuff and they're still fun, but, you know, you don't have the joy of discovery. Well, this book sort of re-gifts you the joy of discovery by just writing a completely crazy sci-fi <laughs> fantasy <laughs> mashup of uh, King Arthur and sort of sci-fi. It's really funny. Trade Federation type <laughs> stuff. Right. <laughs> uh, and uh, some AI stuff. Um, and it's fun. It's It's got some nice surprises. I don't know that we should just give away everything. But. I, I was thinking we should have a non-spoiler section and then a spoiler section. I don't know if that really works. Yeah, let's, there's... Well, let's try So this is the non-spoiler section. Okay. So it is a fun, twisty book. I can imagine some people being repelled by it just because it doesn't quickly give you a way in in terms of a point of view character. It does fairly quickly give you a point of view mm-hmm. character, but maybe not quickly enough for some people. I can imagine a way of restructuring this book that would make it slightly less mysterious and maybe slightly less fun, but might make it a little bit more accessible. And that would merely be to rearrange some chapters and things like that. But she intentionally, I think was having a lark with this book and not mm-hmm. wanting to make it. There's a way it, it would be like the difference between the matrix as we have it, where you are with 
Mr. Anderson the whole time and you are confused along with him and you know mm-hmm. exactly how confused you should be and then information is parceled out to you and you have the joy of discovering exactly what the Matrix is. Well, if you imagine that we scrambled it all around and had some random scenes with Morpheus and Trinity and some random, like, and we, we were all actually doling out more information ahead of time, but before our hero had any context for what the information meant. <laughs> um, obviously, the Matrix has a little teaser where Trinity does some kung fu and stuff, but if you had a bunch of stuff like that and it didn't make any sense, and then it was all supposed to sort of converge in the last third and start making a whole lot of sense, it's a little bit more that sort of things. So you have to have a somewhat high tolerance for intentionally being confused and putting yourself in the hands of an author who's not just going to show you all of her cards right. all at once. Well, she's what she's doing, of course, is she's giving you the experience that the characters are having inside right. the book. Right. Which I love. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, yeah. I, I was not off put by that at all. I can imagine some people being off put by it. But uh, yeah, I love this book. I love a book that can take really old tropes and recontextualize them or remake them in such a way that they become fresh. And this book does things like recon without giving too much away. Uh, we'll have to get to our spoiler section soon, but mm-hmm. it recontextualizes tropes like the robot best friend or like a fight with a dragon, like a knight V dragon mm-hmm. Dawn of justice type scenario. And it just gives them enough sort of recontextualization that they get new life and you're actually invested in a dragon fight and yep. invested in a robot best friend and invested in a wizard learning his craft and uh, all this kind of stuff. And if it sounds like those elements that I just mentioned don't go together, well, that's half the fun of the book is how they go together. Exactly. <laughs> so my short review, my, my short non-spoiler review is you should read this book. It's loads of fun. And Diana Wynne Jones is loads of fun. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to say in this pre sort of spoiler? Uh, I, I'll i just say, as a general observation about Diana Wynne-Jones, she loves disguises in her books. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> she she likes having people disguised sometimes by magic. She likes it when sometimes they don't know that they're in disguise. They don't even know who they are. Mm-hmm. Like, she loves that. I think the main thing that you get from her books, I don't, because I, I don't know that you could pull a theme out of this book exactly. She doesn't really do that. Right. But that's not to say her books don't have anything anything nutritious at all. Right. Because they do. But what it is is self-discovery process. So that's both there in a plot sense of this person was in disguise the whole time where he doesn't even know who he is or you thought he was someone else. But, you know, you've got that kind of thing. But then you've also got, I think, the persistent thing that all of her good characters do is they're like, actually, I am selfish. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was too judgy with my friend. Or they do stuff like that. Yeah. like they, But they learn those lessons in a way that doesn't feel like a lesson. They just kind of discover... Yeah, she has a nice light touch. It's not these big cathartic very scenes of those touch. sorts of things. It's just, and she realized she felt bad. And and then there was a dragon that was over there. It's even stuff like, the one of the, there's a book, House of Many Ways, which I think is Lesser Jones, but it's still fun. It's the third book in the Howl series. But I just, I like that the boy, he's not the main character, but the boy protagonist, like by the end of the book, he's figured out, yeah, he's lazy and he needs to do chores. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you, and you get stuff like that and you don't mind in the slightest. It's just, it's fun. Yeah, I, I like that. I, For someone who was by no means a conservative Christian, she has a nice line in family relationships, a nice line in man-woman relationships, actually. Yeah. Like, she just feels like a sturdy mid-century British woman with halfway conservative values. Even if she would see herself as mm-hmm. progressive, it's like she hadn't progressed enough to be annoying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it almost feels like if Mrs. Weasley wrote a book or something like that, if you want to take a lame modern canard that you'll be familiar with, all you lame people listening. Um, just kidding. Mm-hmm. You're wonderful. But the thing I really want to say is you just like these people. She just, let, she just, yeah. you, she, you like her characters. I yeah, like her too. characters. They're fun. Yeah. And it, there's nothing that bores me more than a plot that is unfolding for its own sake. Like I do not get a lot of joy out of double crosses and disguises and, Oh, this person was actually doing, had this motivation or like that sort of thing can really Mm -hmm. drag. One of the movies that I hate the most is the usual suspects, which has a very famous twist of that type. And it's a good twist, I suppose, but it's not particularly motivated by anything that happens with the people. 
And I hate that sort of thing. When it just feels yeah. like the author is doing calisthenics with plots, it's like, well, anybody can sit down or get in front of a whiteboard mm-hmm. and come up with a complicated plot. When it's not tied to anything that I care about, then I really don't care. It's one of the problems I've always had with Agatha Christie. And Diana Wynne Jones has likable characters that you do care about. Mm-hmm. And just enough meat on the bone in terms of some nutrition in terms of mm-hmm. some thematic weight in terms of it's like she's not yeah. doing she's not doing or saying anything particularly profound in this book but it brushes on slavery and free will and cruelty brokenness darkness right. and how you cope with that right. or don't all without feeling your need to the need to rub your nose in anything particularly yeah. grotesque or right um yeah i guess the only other thing before we maybe dive into spoilers that i have to say is just that it is the flavor of her books is that even if you're going through the most cataclysmic thing ever, confronting the villains or you're having the final showdown, it feels like by the time the characters are done, like they arrived at the hero, they become in a pretty ordinary kind of way somehow. Mm-hmm. And they're still pretty ordinary people. So she always leaves you with that flavor. Like even in this book, to my mind, the characters end in a pretty different place. But you also feel like, and eh, that was a pretty natural progression, actually. And they're still kind of flawed it, people doing the best they can. That's really nice. And she just she avoids so much. And like for someone who is willing to use the tropes of heroic fantasy and of chosen one and all that sort of stuff, she avoids so much that's annoying about those stories in terms of yeah. like, we're not going to just say that everything that this one character does is great because he's great. Mm-hmm. We're also not going to make a big deal out of he's the chosen one, but he can't live up to it. It's just like, mm-hmm. nah, he's our, our main sort of protagonist our our wizard character in this is he feels like a a good hero somebody that you like and Mm -hmm. are glad that he is able to fight his demons but it also feels like he's probably always going to be fighting some of those demons and that's okay and yeah well let's get into some spoilers i recommend the book it's a 10 out of 10 i think and what would you like to say in spoiler land ben (laughs) I don't know what to say in spoiler land. Uh, let's see. Oh. There's a super fun central conceit in this book, which is that there is a oh, machine or intelligence that was designed to put you in a kind of artificial reality and then to play out various scenarios until <laughs> such time as you find as as it solves the problem. So. If I want to solve the problem of creating the perfect podcast about Hexwood, then I turn on this machine, I tell it that's what I want, and then Ben and I sit here over the course of a million years. With the vague thought that we've done this before, and maybe right. we become wait, maybe we realize what's happening. Wait a minute, we've got to turn this dumb machine off. Right. We're trapped in in a loop of iterations, not a loop, but we're trapped in a billion iterations of this podcast. Right. Um, but the machine is just gonna keep make us keep doing it until we get it right. Even to tell you that much, though, if you're if you ventured into the dark territory of spoilers without having read the book, uh-huh. if you're if you're one of those people, yeah, it doesn't really capture it because the book's not all about that in the way that you could imagine. You could imagine someone yeah. building a story just around that. Nope, that's um, just one element of the story. <laughs> that's one element. She also wants to fold in a bunch of Arthurian lore. She wants to explain. She wants to posit that our planet is just a, a little outpost that happens to have some valuable stuff that people like to harvest from it but Mm -hmm. we've been sort of kept as an intentional backwater in the larger galactic scheme of things because Mm -hmm. people actually don't want us to realize how valuable our flint is and so they're keeping us kind of Uh from discovering better technology and stuff like that keeping us where we're at basically right so you've got kind of a fun galactic conceit that it's sort of a dune-ish flavor to the galactic conceit yeah, it's, it's Dune. It's there's almost a little Scott Adams in it. It's very or not Scott Adams. Um, what's oh, Douglas Adams. Douglas Adams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's just it's got a, a wry enough touch with all that stuff. It's not outright silly like uh, Douglas Adams. No, is. no, but it's yeah, it is wry. I don't know what to say. Spoiler wise, I just I like all the stuff. I like the machine. Mm-hmm. It's a great. We really are going to start spoiling things here, folks. If we keep talking, so just know that I recommend reading this book without spoilers. Personally, I think it's better. I think it's more fun. Maybe you're the kind of person who doesn't care, but I still think it's more fun. For this book, For I, this book. I sometimes yeah. don't care. But It's not just a book with a twist. That's not what we're talking about. It's like the book is twisty by design in a really fun, sort of organic way. Mm-hmm. So anyway, just know that um, the Bandis is a great character. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's really wonderful. It is. Uh, it, it's fun. I still don't actually want to spoil who it is, but it's fun who it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun who it it's is. It's a lot of fun who it is. It's a lot of fun who it is. And it's fun what its plan was. Man, and the way that it gets its, satis- its bloody satisfaction. Mm-hmm. It was very satisfying. Yes. In that sense, what a mishmash. It's also like a revenge thriller. Yeah, almost Except like Except you don't know till the very end that that's what it is. Right. Oh, man, and boy, did that guy deserve it. Yeah, it does a nice job oh, setting man. up the villains and giving them enough humanity, but also enough cruelty without rubbing your nose in any of it. There's just an, any number of things that are usually done in such a heavy-handed way and such, oh, in this goodness. kind of stuff. And you, she just does it with such a light touch. You have a really fun last dragon fight. Mm-hmm. It was like, I didn't remember how it went, but man, it was just very satisfying. You're yeah, it's, like, it's actually a genuinely good action scene for one thing. Right. It is. And yeah, then and all the characters get something to do and uh, yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. You've got a really fun wizard character. Mm-hmm. You've got a, you've got a great female protagonist. Yeah. Not overpowered or none of the sort of Mary Sue tropes that we're so tired of these days. Not, no. not real feminist, feministy feeling. No. It's not going out of its way to make her a damsel in distress either, but it's like, not that we want it to necessarily. I'm not, I'm just saying it's refreshing how much it's just like, well, she's the girl character, so I'm just going to write her the way she would be and, and not have a chip on my shoulder in either direction. Right. Like, I, I don't have to actually make a political statement with this character. She can just be a character. That's right. And I'm a person who's perceptive enough about human nature to understand you write female characters a little bit different than you write male characters in terms of their abilities in terms of what they want in terms of how they act and that's really nice and that's nice about Howl's Moving Castle too it's nice about a lot of her stuff I um, I was gonna say there is a place where this book like you said she doesn't rub your nose in violence and things Mm -hmm. but there is a place where she gestures towards some crazy dark stuff yeah which is in our our hero Mordion's backstory which I didn't remember I'm pretty glad some of that went over my head as a kid Mm -hmm. especially the one thing where his best friend girl is anyway yeah that i was like oh boy yeah i don't think i really marked that as a kid reading this and that's probably good because mm-hmm. that's pretty you don't have to say anything because of the kind of stuff she's talking about i just was like ah <laughs> yeah it was dark I, I can't say i really minded it in terms no, of you know, no as, as an adult reading the book no was... I, I i i wouldn't say that either i was only thinking in terms of kids mm-hmm. coming to this book and just be careful yeah just be careful. It's Danny Wynne Jones will go into the darkness. Mm-hmm. And she might only take three sentences to do it, but he, yeah, those three she, sentences say a lot without, saying, a lot. without, without, saying, much without saying much of anything. Which is cool. A nice trick if you can do it. I mean, she fully turns this into an Arthurian story <laughs> with walk ons from <laughs> characters who, for most, because of the way the sci fi of it all is set up, characters you don't know. I mean, we're full spoilers now are Arthur and Merlin and various characters. And then, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And one I didn't remember existed at all and you wouldn't unless you were a nerd right uh what fits full full i don't remember his name it's from like the siegfried martin legend something the, and it's really it's, it's really fun <laughs> yeah i mean it just it makes you hate christopher nolan that's what it makes me do christopher nolan well he's, he's oh, my, my oh, placeholder oh, for oh, hacky oh, oh, sci-fi oh. that just relies on the same old boring old tropes and repackages them well yeah. you know what yeah the best comparison to this would be something like inception mm-hmm Oh, it's a dream within a dream within a dream, and you don't know what's real, and it's like a big maze. Well, you read Hexwood, and you're like, oh, this is actually how this kind of thing should be done Mm -hmm. for multiple reasons. Well, and you feel like it's someone who, like if she wrote Inception, if if you just pointed a gun at her head and said, I need you to write about dream robbers, she would probably, A, she'd give you some really likable characters with distinctive colorful personalities, which, which Inception does not do. B, she'd be like, what is it like to dream? You know, and then she would, and then she, whereas Christopher Nolan has apparently never had a dream in his life or if, his, or his dreams, if they, if he does dream, he dreams of movies on TBN, like old James Bond movies or something like it's all compounds exploding and stuff who dreams about compounds in the snow exploding. So did, uh, yeah, it, for a movie, one of the central dream, popular dream movies of our life, and it doesn't have an ounce of insight into what a dream is. And that's, I'm sorry to make it into a Christopher Nolan. He's, he's just my, Tenet was actually the one I was thinking of where it's like this mm. twisty backwards and forwards, timey-wimey kind of uh-huh. 
actually, my friend, we became friends in my past, but your future. Mm. It's like I got all those kinds of things. Yep. And none of pe- it lands. People eat their popcorn, shove popcorn into their mouth and say, oh, I can't believe <laughs> like, you should you should read this book and see what it's like when someone with some. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know people, <laughs> our listeners are offended. They like Christopher uh, Nolan. They, they like do. to stuff popcorn into their mouth. That's fine. I like to stuff popcorn into my mouth. Christopher Nolan isn't my taste, which is his real crime against me. If he was, then I would forgive him all the things that I'm talking about, as you do. I just want you to know you're forgiving him. I, I don't want you to think <laughs> his plots are actually good because they're not. Um, <laughs> he's not a good science sci fi writer. No. So, yeah. This is good sci-fi. This is good fantasy. It's actually a compelling, fun world that feels self-motivated, not like it was propped up just because she had a certain kind of story she wanted to tell. Yeah, what's fun is you actually, by the end of it, you have this crazy epic story Mm -hmm. with an even more epic backdrop that you didn't expect. You didn't expect it to go to Arthurian legend. (laughs) You didn't expect that. But it doesn't feel unfair Mm -hmm. by the time you're done. The way that... And I don't... the way that she blends the sci-fi and the magic of it right. is really compelling, and it feels fair as well. She just sets the rules of the world up that way. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. There's just so many, there's so many layers to this one, mm-hmm. so many things that it's doing at the same time that I don't... I'm, I, it seems like a pretty hard one to reverse engineer. It's the kind of thing that makes you, if you read it and you get it, and you understand why Neil Gaiman is like, yeah, she's one of the best writers I ever knew. She's better than me. That's what Neil Gaiman would say. Well, it's rare to read a book that has that does so many fun things that we all love. A dragon fight at the end. It's mm-hmm. not reinventing the wheel, actually, in terms of the sort of satisfaction it gives you in good versus evil, in right. heroes versus villains, in, and, in romance. And, and, stuff and, like and the way it uses and subverts the hero's journey trope for at least, I think, three characters. Right. But it, it uses it as well as subverses, subverts That's it. Right. It's not just subverting it. It's, no. it's, it's actually giving you everything that you want from this kind of a story. But it's also giving you a story that you genuinely don't know where it's going to go. And you genuinely don't know where you're at. And, and so it has all the satisfaction. It's like I said, it, it takes stuff that we all love and then it reinvents it in such a way that it you don't recognize it. And and when the stuff, when good triumphs over evil, for example, it sneaks up on you. You're not like, okay, we're into act three. Now mm-hmm. the bad guys have marshaled their forces. It's like right. how many books, even fantasy things that I like, take something like Neil Gaiman's Coraline. As soon as you know the concept of Coraline, you know pretty much how it's going to go. You basically know the story. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and that's not really a criticism. Mm-hmm. That's how most stories are. You walk into most yeah. movies and you're like, well, maybe the hero died, maybe he lives, but I, I know about where I'm gonna at and about where I'm gonna arrive, and yep. that's what I'm paying for. That's what I want. You yep. know, well, okay, how, two a third of the way into Jurassic Park, the dinosaurs are gonna escape. We're gonna run around and uh-huh. some people beat, and like that's what I want. That's fine. It, surprise is not always a virtue. Sometimes inevitability is a virtue, but it is so fun when someone can take all these tropes and and reinvent them in a way that. You actually don't recognize them. As the pieces fall into place, you actually, you're like, oh, I just read a good versus evil thing. I, I didn't know that's what I was doing. Mm-hmm. But now I get the fun of having done that, a thing that I always love to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a little bit like how, I'm trying, trying to think of reference points for people. It's a little bit how I felt when I first watched The Matrix in 99. The Matrix yeah. so much falls into tropes that I th- I'd say two thirds of the way through, you're like, oh, okay, this is just. Star Wars or the hero's journey. And that's what we're doing. And I understand that. And now he's going to have a Kung Fu fight. But for the first two thirds of the matrix, the first time you see it, what's so fun about the movie is that you actually don't realize it's going to be a Campbellian journey. And that emerges gradually. And by the time it turns into a Campbellian journey, they've taken something really old and really stale and they've made it new. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's good. And that's true. That's a little bit what the, the feeling of this will do, except for there's not the thing that the Matrix does, which is fun in its own right, but is is they, they kind of, the Matrix kind of gives up on that around the time that we massacre everybody in the lobby. The Matrix is just like, okay, now you know what movie you're in. You're in a shoot 'em up. Uh, mm-hmm. Hero's got to find himself and defeat the bad guy movie. Diana Wynne Jones 
can actually not let you not know what kind of movie you're in until the last chapter. Mm -hmm. And then you look back on it and you realize what kind of movie you were in. But you know you're going on a fun journey anyway. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Well, this one did live up to my childhood memories. I was very happy about that. Just at a, we just today recorded a podcast on a, a childhood movie that I loved that did not live up to my love of it. Alas. Alas. But this one I was like, man, that was great. That was probably even better than when I was a kid. Yep. I really liked it too. I only wish there was time enough to, I, I wish I could go into a machine that would have me read each Diana Wynn Jones book and not take my time because there's not time to read all the Diana Wynn Jones books. But uh, to, to be a kid, a kid again and to have Diana Wynn Jones would be a nice thing. I've been, I found myself listening to, there's an audiobooks of an awful lot of them on mm-hmm. the library app. So I found myself just picking away at those sometimes. That's fun. Yeah. I'll have to do that. Yeah. Recommend it. Charmed Life is what I recommend next. If you want to see the origins of Harry Potter. But when you read it now, it feels like it's subverting Harry Potter, right. <laughs> which is funny. Predecessor by a good amount of time. Yep. Well, she's so tricksy. She subverted it before it was even invented. There you go. And just like the Bannis itself. But yeah. 10 out of 10 for me. Yep. Same for me. Great book. A lot of fun. I mean, it does yield its surface pleasures a little bit more slowly than some of the other books. So depending on what kind of person you are and what kind of books you enjoy, there may be some of the books that we've talked about that you would enjoy more or that you would get more out of quicker. Maybe. Um, But as long as you like some slow burn, like for me, an author who knows how to do a good slow burn at the start is probably my favorite. Yeah. And she's really good at that. If, If this sounds like the kind of book that you would like from us talking about it, then I can say you probably love it. So, yeah, I think that's all that we have to say. If people love us and want to support us, Ben, how do they do it? Mm, Nathan, they go to patreon.com forward slash sound of sanity. That's right. <laughs> thank, you, thank you. And support us there. Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's what you do. You'll get access to our Discord all kinds of cool stuff, and no one will ever say to you, you're a loser, loser, you're a loser, loser. I guess that's all we got to say. I guess so. Until next time. I asked you for hobbits on a grail quest, and not one hobbit have I seen. That guy was fun. (laughs) That guy was great.